Thanks for checking out the Ideal Impact Podcast, where we discuss five key skills and the impact they can have on your life as well as some major issues in society. You ready to get after it? We're live. What's up, everybody? We are going to be taking a deep dive into emotional intelligence today with episode six. And uh, I have Kyle Wakeman here with me. What's up, Kyle? Oh, how you doing there? Uh, we are missing a lag of the tripod tonight. So unfortunately, Brian had to deal with a medical. Luckily, doesn't sound like it's horribly serious, but uh, one of his son's split his head he got some stitches sounds like might be dealing with a concussion so we're wishing brian the best tonight and that's the beauty of having three of us is i'm sure there's going to be times where i won't be able to make it randy the same thing so we are trying something new so this is our first episode with only only two, two of us, us so yeah. we have to embrace the unknown randy we embrace the unknown you know we're a, what, we're a family first organization, and uh, when something's happened with family, you got to take care of that. So shout out to Easton. I know you're listening. Yeah, so yeah, hope you feel better. Yeah, and probably gonna have a badass scar on his forehead, which the chicks dig love. scars. Chicks, chicks dig scars. <laughs> I mean, I know he's only three, but hey, you got to start somewhere. Hey, hey, that but that scar is just gonna you know maybe it'll grow, it'll look more badass. We can come up with Easton when you're ready. We'll talk through it. Maybe we come up with a crazy story that you got yeah. attacked by like a land shark or some other Ooh. wild Ohio animal. The alcoholic beverage. Land, land shark. shark. Yeah, Ooh, got him. Yeah, got maybe him. <laughs> maybe he like had too many Zemos. Yeah, and got into a fist fight with a grizzly bear or some something along those lines. Fisticuffs. Yeah, we've all been there with Zemas. Yeah, Zemas with Jolly Ranchers. That was always the way to go. Yeah. Do you remember when Zemas made that comeback a couple years ago? And they were everywhere. I sure do. I sure do. I had one of them, and I'm like, yeah, I don't know how people drink this. <laughs> it was way too sweet. We were somewhere. I want to say, I don't know if we were at a training or if we were at AT, and I just remember we were not there when Zema came, and I was like, make sure you get a case of Zemas because it's going to sell out. And as soon as I got home, I had one. And I was like, this this is not what I remember. <laughs> it's terrible. Well, yeah, as a kid, like that's sweet. Like I I remember as a kid, so when we, we were living in Connecticut and one of my friend's dads down the street, uh, he loved Zima. That was all he drank was Zimas. And I remember did your dog sip. just open the door? No, Callie did that. Oh, I was gonna say that is <laughs> that is amazing. Yeah, the dogs were in here with me because <laughs> they were going batshit crazy because Callie and her mom took her mom's dogs for a walk. They walk by the window and Sophie becomes extremely jealous and she loses it. So they got to hang out with me for a little bit, but she cannot. She Sorry, can open doors. Yeah, that's but okay. that's awesome. <laughs> she can't open some doors like screen doors and stuff like that. But yeah, so he had Zimas, drank them all the time. I remember having a sip when I was little, you know, so I, I lived in Connecticut from first to fourth grade. And I was like, ooh, like this is really good. Well, I haven't drank pop in, I don't know, since like high school. So when Zima's made a comeback and I had that first sip, it was just, I was like, if I drink a whole one of these, I'm going to have the worst headache of my life tomorrow. <laughs> That's what happens when you get old. I was super excited for it because I just remember. I like, remember. Trust me. Yeah, I remember. Like I was like, because I remember my first party ever. I had like three Zimas and I was trashed. I was like, <laughs> woohoo, life of the party. <laughs> I was like, man, I haven't had Zimas in forever. And I used to go, every time I'd go out to the bar, like in my late 20s, early 30s, I would order a Zima just to screw with the, the servers. And they'd be like, what the I hell is a Zima? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you always ask for a Zima. And then uh, they're like, I don't know what that is. And then when it came back, I was like, wow, this is this is like, this is my moment. And then I had that first one. And I was like, damn, this is just not, it's not good. <laughs> so sorry i mean i'm sorry zima but yeah sorry i don't i don't know who produced it whatever it did it was it it did not and i remember yeah. i was the same thing i was like these things are gonna sell out like hockey dude you can go get them anytime you wanted because <laughs> no, one, no one wanted those things i remember you ordering a zima when we were at frickers at drill one weekend and that poor girl she was probably like 20 21 like super young She's like, um, I, I, let me, let me go see if we have that. Like, I've, I've never heard of that before. And that was before they came back. So yeah, sure enough, they didn't, they did not, it wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't out a thing. Yeah. So 
How's your week going so far? What are, what are, what are some, some of those wins that you have? Maybe wins, maybe any challenges that you, you've had to maybe maybe leverage some emotional intelligence to to navigate, Randy? Well, you know, it's only Tuesday, so... We're, I turned we're, up on a Tuesday once. Yeah, oh, we're just into that. the we're just into the week. But um, yeah, Monday was a rough day. You know, just Mondays are typically my my toughest day at work with the the students I have on that day, and and it was no different on this Monday. It was uh, <laughs> we we were playing soccer outside. I mean, the the weather was awesome. I've been able to work on my tan, so there's a win there. I'm like I'm able to go outside, get fresh air, but just like these kids cannot play a game without fighting or calling each other names or putting each other down. It's just constant. So I, all I did all day was put out fires. So Monday was a rough day. And then today, like it's so easy to take that, that bad day and then make your whole week bad. Mm-hmm. And I've been working on just trying to let it go and forget it and move on to the next thing. So today was way better. Today was way better. Mm-hmm. So I'll, I'm going to take that as a win. That's a huge win. And when I was still at the corporate job, I every Monday, almost virtually every Monday, I can't I can't say every single Monday, but typically, like you said, it was just horrible. And and that only it bled into my Sundays, too. So my Sundays evenings, especially I wouldn't sleep well because I was anticipating the next day and I was thinking about what was waiting for me. So I'd have a terrible day Monday. My entire day would be ruined. And it was almost I was talking to somebody about this earlier. It was like. I didn't even feel like me. Like I would almost have this out of body experience where I was watching myself be miserable. And it's like, what are you doing? And then my week would progressively get better. Right. So I got to the weekend, Friday night, Saturday would be awesome. And then it started all over again. It was just cyclical. And in some cases, even though I was trying my hardest to lean on my emotional intelligence, again, it came back to that point where my life was just so far out of alignment. Like the way that I was living, the person that I was being was so far from what I wanted out of life and who I wanted to be. It was just really, really hard. And there were many times where I had to lean on other people in those cases to help pull me out of that mindset. So that's another thing with these skills, right? Like emotional intelligence, if you're having those bad days, you always have people there that are willing to help you talk to you, figure it out, try to get to the bottom of that mindset. What's the real root cause here? And how do we navigate the situation and the ability to overcome that mindset and change it? Right. So, um, my, my win for this week is, is also why my day was bad yesterday. So, well, not bad. Right. But I had a moment of annoyance (laughs) for lack of a better term, but Episodes four and five of the podcast, I uploaded them to Spotify. So I use I use Spotify to upload everything and they were showing up on Apple, but they weren't showing up on Spotify, which made no sense. And I was getting I, no errors, no notifications as to why this was happening. I spent most of the morning chatting back and forth with somebody at Spotify. They were great, super helpful. And I ended up having to re-edit to episode four and five because i had put a clip in the beginning before the intro music and apparently that messed everything up so i had to go back in i had to delete that clip i had to re slide basically everything over to the front so the audio and and video lined up and then i had to re-download everything which my computer's slow so it took forever But ultimately, by the end of the day, I had four and five up. They were on Spotify. They're on Apple. They're on YouTube. So the the win out of that situation is one, I got them fixed. So they're available. And two, for me, that was still way better than any Monday that I experienced in my double (laughs) T job. Like my mindset was not nearly as bad as it used to be. I got everything that I needed to accomplish while I was downloading the podcast instead of working on whatever it was that I was going to be working on that time on my computer. I took that opportunity to go outside, get some yard work done down here for Callie's mom. So ultimately it ended up being a great day and I got to do the same thing, work on my tan. I mean, it could have been so much worse, right? So being able to talk myself through that situation and remind myself that, Hey, I'm, I'm getting to choose my hard right now where before somebody else chose it for me, it's a pretty big win, right? So I thought that was, 
awesome. That is a good win. I got another win that I could think yeah. of. I mean, this, let's go, this, let's is, go. this is a loss followed by a win. I like loss, that. Loss followed by a win. So, mm. so last night I, uh, I experienced, uh, my first time being choked unconscious at, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that was a great text to receive. That, yeah. that was awesome. So I was at class and, uh, we were sparring and I was going with one of our Brown belts and, uh, I was passing his guard and he, and he came up and he got inside my gi for what they call a baseball bat choke. And it's, this is like a hail Mary when someone's passing your guard and like he had like my gi and it wasn't tight. And I was like, ah, he doesn't have it. So I kept, I kept going for the pass and he starts to to roll. Cause that's what you're supposed to do for the move. And I was like, it's still not tight. I got this. I can take his back from here or I can slide up and hit an arm bar. And then next thing I know, I wake up. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> I was like, what the hell happened? And he was like, he's like, I don't, he's like, as I was rolling, man, he's like, it just kept getting tighter. He's like, then my hands got stuck in your gi. He's like, and you were tapping. He's like, but I couldn't pull my hands out. So I just kept going. He's like, and you were out cold. And I was like, how long was I out for? And he was like, 30 seconds. And I was like, damn. I was like, oh, yeah. I was like, it was like an out of body experience. Like I, yeah. I, I thought I was dreaming. I was laying there and like, I literally was having a dream. And then like I heard myself doing that weird breathing and mm -hmm. then and then I heard voices and then I woke up and I was looking around and I was like, what the hell now? So that's a, that's a loss. Like I got <laughs> choked out. I submitted like you submit in in jujitsu. That's it's a loss, but it's also a learning experience. Like now right. what I should have done is as soon as he got a hold of my gi, I should have broke his grips instead of being cocky and trying to pass anyway like you you don't pass somebody when their hands are on your neck that's not a good idea yeah. pulled off but i was like ah i'm fine well lesson learned that would have like ruined the rest of my week mm -hmm. like i would have been like i suck i got tapped out what am i doing wrong i'm gonna quit jujitsu this is terrible <laughs> and i like literally like it didn't it didn't affect me yeah. at all like i laid there for like 30 seconds caught got my bearings and i was like all right i'm like let's finish the round because there was still like two minutes left and mm -hmm. we just kept going and yeah and then afterwards i was like man i can't believe that i, I was unconscious there that's crazy i'm like people yeah. pay people pay for that <laughs> <laughs> i mean technically you're paying for it too you're paying yeah, to go to class true. right that's true. <laughs> just the different intent behind the yeah. payment that i you're... didn't experience the same excitement as others who, who pay for those things Oh man. But what you said there, so DJ, so I train jujitsu at a different gym than Randy does and DJ, a friend of mine, and also our, the gym owner, lead instructor, uh, he's a brown belt. We have black belts to train with us obviously as well, but DJ always yells at us, stop trying to win practice. Right. And that's your ego. When you're trying to win practice and submit someone every time that you go out there and that's your only goal, you're 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 working on the wrong things like you said you either win or you learn like there really is no losing and that's the same thing in competition too like if i don't win i'm going to learn something and even if i do win i hopefully just learn something as well right i learned right. what i did right in that situation if i don't win that match i learn what i need to do better the next time right and when <laughs> jujitsu is such a humbling sport sure like for me so Randy wrestled in college. I did no combat sports other than Taekwondo when I was a little kid. And let's be honest, like that doesn't even count. <laughs> but man, I would go in there. I'm six, four at the time when I started jujitsu, I think it was like 230, 235. And I would just get worked by <laughs> people that were half my set. Randy would kick the crap out of me. You remember that time when it was just you and I in the gym and I just completely had a meltdown and yeah, you're being a dick. Yeah. I, I 100% <laughs> lost my emotional intelligence and that was my ego speaking. That was my ego. Instead of focusing on the lesson learned and instead of focusing on getting better, I was 100% only focused on the result of the match and my ego hurt and I completely freaked out not only did I ruin my, I was in a bad mood that entire day. I ruined my, I was to the point, it was so bad where you didn't even want to train with me. You're like, I'm not going to do this anymore. If you're going to act like an asshole like that. And I you should, you that. that was the right thing to tell me. <laughs> but, and again, that was really 
man, had we even started this yet? Like, had we even? No. no. So that was no. both, that was pre ideal. And yeah. that's how far I've personally come since then is I get my ass kicked all the time. Like I'm rolling with, you know, purple belts and brown belts and black belts, Jose, Nick, these guys that are, that are really fucking good at jujitsu. And I never get upset anymore because I mean, and Jose laughs at me, you know, he, <laughs> do, he does it to everybody. Like he'll be right. choking you out and laughing at you, but it's fun. And he's having fun with what he does. And that's what it's all about is learning, having fun, getting better. Jiu-jitsu, I can't say it enough. Like, and not just jujitsu, Muay Thai, wrestling, martial arts in general. Like if you're not doing it and you've ever thought about doing it, and it's something that you even have the slightest inclination that you might enjoy, go do it. It will benefit you in so many other ways than just the physical it's 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 one of the best things you can do for yourself no it's life-changing it's like it's changed my life like the first time i ever went like i was going with our our instructor now he like i started right out of college like i called and i was like hey i want to come check this out and at the time the guy was a purple belt and he's like yeah come up here he's like call dresser it's awesome you can work with me on my takedowns because he was still competing so i went up there i must have took him down probably like 45 times straight into a submission. Every time I got a takedown, I, <laughs> I was the one tapping and I was like, man, I am getting my ass kicked. This is a humbling experience. Yeah. I ended up having to make a choice. Do I want to do jujitsu or do I want to coach wrestling? I ultimately, I chose to coach. And then once I, you know, gave up the coaching, I went back to jujitsu because you persuaded me to do it. Cause it's not an easy thing to do. Like at 36 years old yeah. to go back into a gym with a bunch of young kids and, and grapple because you know mm -hmm. like no matter like what kind of shape i'm in as a 36 year old like I, I feel like i'm in decent shape it's not the same as someone who's 25 and in decent shape like it's not the same dude i train with chris Draghi. shout out to you congratulations on your win the other night as well i unfortunately didn't get the chance to watch it but but i heard great things that guy's a freaking animal he is an animal he's an all-american collegiate wrestler and the the single hardest person hardest working person i've ever witnessed with my own eyes i mean the things that he puts himself through physically talk about discipline and his nickname's the grit and 100 you know fitting the gr gritty it is it is an awesome thing he's tenacious he's gritty he's disciplined the guy i mean he's athletic i used to get so mad <laughs> that he would kick my ass <laughs> And he's my size too. And it's like, why am I getting mad? Like this dude's a fucking animal. Like I eventually changed my mindset to that. I overcame my ego and I'm like, I'm instead of doing that, I just want to be a really good training partner for this guy. Like if I can do that at my age with my lack of experience, I'll be very happy with that. And in order to hopefully help make him a little bit better. Right. But that's right. the humility that comes with what you just said, <laughs> going out there and just, Man, some of those guys are killers. Like, and I know that you train with some freaking killers too up at 440. Yeah, another and Lake Erie guy, another Lake Erie All American, Evan Rossborough, like purple belt, went to ADCCs and and he's beating black belts and takes fourth in a 30 man bracket. Like, that's insane. Yeah, Evan beat the shit out of me one time. I rolled with him. I'm like, dude, this guy's at next level. Like, yeah, and he's usually not even like putting in a whole lot of effort, which makes mm, you even no. more, but like, I'm like, I can't get mad because like he's in his mid 20s. I, I, my mind thinks that my body can move like it used to. And then mm -hmm. I go to do it and it, it doesn't work. And I'm like, well, that's what happens when you're almost 40 and you have all the injury. <laughs> but yeah, it's a humbling experience. Like you said, like not trying to win practice. Like that is so hard to get in your head. That took me a year to get in my head. But if you're trying to win practice, wh what positions are you going to be in? You're either well you're going to be in a position where you like where you're used to being like for me as a wrestler oh yeah yeah i see what you're you're going to stay in your dominant position how am i going to learn anything and grow in this this sport or this martial yeah. art if i'm only focusing on one area if i'm trying to win practice for me it's going to be i'm going to be in top position i'm right. going to try to hold you down well what is going to happen when i find somebody who gets on top of me i'm going to have no idea what to do yeah so, you, you know, you just have to put yourself in those positions and, and, and not try to win practice. Like if you get submitted, uh, who cares? Is that the end of the world? Is your life over? No. Like one thing that um, Mark says is he's like, as a black belt, he's like, that just means that I've tapped out, I've tapped out more than anybody else. Mm -hmm. It's a yeah, great way to look at it. Right. He's right. Yeah. He just didn't quit. 
Yeah. That's the thing. And, and what, so what you said when I said being on the bottom, because I'm not a wrestler, right? So, <laughs> and I'm tall. So my best position is the guard. Like I feel very comfortable being on my back as long as I can keep somebody in my guard. Now, the problem is I train with a lot of very high level wrestlers. So keeping them in my guard is typically not I mean, it works out sometimes. Like, don't get me wrong. Like I submit some of these guys here and there, but typically they're not going to stay in my guard. They're doing everything in their power to get the hell out of my guard because they know that they are not in a dominant position in that specific case. So I have to be better at pushing myself to try to maintain top control, right? Like that's uncomfortable for me because I feel like a fish out of water. I'm not a wrestler. I'm not used to being on the top. And in order for me to prog progress my jujitsu skills, I have to do that. So again, that comes back to what we talk about so frequently is be intentional with putting yourself in an uncomfortable position. And that's why jujitsu, I mean, jujitsu running, like there's so many things that are just great metaphors for life when you look at them, because if I can put myself in uncomfortable positions to get better at jujitsu, I can put myself in uncomfortable positions in my life in order to get better and eventually achieve the level of success that I want for myself. Agreed. And people are probably wondering, like, why the hell are these guys going off on a tangent on jujitsu? But this like this relates to life more than you realize, like you're this is there's so much ego involved. Like mm -hmm. in, if you are only focused on winning certain positions, that's your ego talking. You're you're not going to grow. You're all, you're going to be stuck in that one position. And that's what you're going to be good at. It's the same thing in life. If you let your ego take control, you're going to stay in that comfort zone and you're going to be afraid to step out of it. Right. And your ego is emotions. Like the ego is constructed of emotions. So if you can't learn to manage your ego, then it's going to be very hard to become emotionally intelligent because a lot of the times when you lose your temper or you feel insecure, that that's your ego speaking. Right. And right. like we talked about in the connect call. So we, we, Randy and I just had the connect call right before we started recording the, the podcast today. Double we duty talked, tonight, double duty, double, double duty ideal. But that was a based on emotional intelligence. Right. And we talked about the ego, the ego can be good or the ego can be bad, right? And it's all about managing it. You can use it to your advantage or you can use it to drive your fear, right? So so David had brought up that the ego, your ego can protect you. And I think that's 100% true. And there are certain cases where certain times where you need to be protected, right? You need to protect yourself. You need to go into that mode where it's like, hey, like, I need to be safe in this moment so I don't make a mistake that could be very costly, right? However, your ego can also drive you out of your comfort zone because your ego is the one saying, hey, I'm going to be successful. I'm going to be super successful and I'm going to leverage my ego in a productive manner to push myself outside of my comfort zone and overcome that fear of the unknown and that uncomfortable situation. But I'm going to, again, manage that, process it, and push forward. I mean, you could also take that ego too far where you're like, I'm the greatest thing ever and right. you need to be brought back down a notch. Right. You got to keep that ego in check because it's it's like once you start getting wins and those wins start building up, it's easy to let that ego kind of get out of control and you got to keep that ego in check. That's why like when we say that do something uncomfortable every day, like I feel like that helps bring you back down a level because you're putting mm -hmm. yourself in a position that you normally wouldn't be in. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Something that I wanted to share. So we talked about a little bit of, you know, hey, share some examples of, you know, emotional intelligence and when you lacked emotional intelligence. And I wanted to share something. And I think I've briefly talked about this in some of the other episodes, but I don't think I went into the great detail. And this was a huge thing. So and this was specifically talking about fear and fear driving my decision making. So one of the big things with emotional intelligence, and this is one big thing for me, is making decisions based on emotions is typically not going to result in the best outcome. You might get lucky sometimes, right? And, and, and it might be okay. But a lot of the times, if you're making a decision in an emotional state, probably not going to be the best. So I left my W2 job twice <laughs> and fear drove me back. So the first time I left my W2 job and and I've 
had a huge realization with this over the last couple of weeks through a very good book that I just read, The Eagle That Drank Hummingbird Nectar. So funky title. It's interesting. But yeah, yeah. And if you read the book, you'll understand. But Patrick Menfi, thank you so much for sending me that copy. That meant the world to me. And it was specifically to help with art, with coaching. So I will send that to you, Randy, or I'll bring it home with me so you can read it as well. Sounds good. Yeah. But when I left my W2 job the first time, so again, I made over a hundred thousand dollars a year and I stepped into the unknown and I had really no plan. So I left my W2 job. I was very fortunate to have the opportunity to go work for very good friends of mine at their roofing company. They welcomed me in. And the unknown there was, it was a commission-based job, 100% commission-based. So I went from having a salary job where I could work four hours, I could work eight hours, I could work 10 hours a day. I was getting paid my paycheck every two weeks, right? I had paid time off, all of this. I stepped out of that. And here's where I lacked emotional intelligence the first time. I thought that all of the issues, all of the problems in my life were due to my W-2 job. And that was horribly unemotionally intelligent, right? I was I was not taking into consideration any of the, my life, past life experience, any of the emotions that were going into it. I was strictly running away from that, right? Well, right there, probably it was it probably wasn't going to work out because I didn't have something to run towards. And now the second time that I've done that, I've had I have ideal. I have my purpose in life. I'm running towards this. There is no looking back, right? But in that specific case, I was just running away from that. So there's opportunity number one. Be more intentional when leaving a job. <laughs> have something <laughs> else to run towards rather than just trying to in my opinion, some people it works out for you just take the leap and you figure it out. You build the parachute on the way down. That's not how I operate. So what happened was once I left there and I was living this less stable life and living in this unknown world, my anxiety, my fear, everything just skyrocketed. And what was the first thing that I wanted to do? I wanted to run back to the shit that I knew. I wanted to run back to the stability. And again, I shouldn't even say the things that I know. And this is something that I talked about with my coach today. But the more predictable, right? It was more predictable. I don't know. Your my comfort job, zone. Yeah, you my comfort to go back zone. to your comfort zone. Right. But that job could have been gone the next day. I don't know. Maybe they they eliminated that position when I went back. I, I right. you know, nothing for is 100 percent known, but it is more predictable, right? So I ran back to that. Had I taken a few days to fully process that and think, why are you doing this? Why are you going back? What is your plan? I would have realized that I shouldn't have gone back in the first place, right? But in my head, I had allowed my fear to drive me so far as to construct this grandiose plan and make myself believe that I had the right intent by going back. And that entire time, I was so wrong. And deep down inside, had I really dug deep, I would have known that. But again, I let that fear, that anxiety, that discomfort, that lack of stability, I let all of that drive me right back. And within a month, I'm like, why did I do this? And at that point in time, we had started ideal. We had gotten the concept, like we were figuring things out. And had I not had that, had we not done that, had we not made that progress, maybe, maybe going back would have worked out a little bit longer term than it did. I made it five months, like <laughs> not right. a long time. But yeah, so that's just when you're feeling that fear can also be a good thing, right? Like what drives me now is my fear of potential regret in the future. Like if I'm that 80 year old man that I talked about and I'm full of regret for never trying and never taking any risks in my life that fear now drives me to take the leap, to venture into the unknown, to continue to push forward, right? Because every day is unknown. And if you do not embrace the unknown, you will never achieve the level of success that you want to. And again, this is all stuff that I talked about with my coach today. And it was just, man, it was enlightening. It was awesome. So I just wanted to share that story because again, I've touched on it briefly, but I never went into great detail about it. So yeah, I let fear drive me back to a job that I was just so miserable and because it was so far away from what I wanted to do with my life. 
So it, to me, it sounds like you're saying emotional intelli- intelligence doesn't mean that you have all the answers. It just means that you need to process and manage your emotions before you take action. Yeah, ideally, right? Like there, there are going to be situations where you have to make a decision, right? Especially when you think about it from a leadership perspective. Like sometimes like you have to make a decision, but that's going to be few and far between, right? Typically, you're going to have at least a couple of minutes to sit right. there and process it and be intentional with that and not let that emotion drive you. And that emotion might be a very positive emotion, right? Like this is something else I used to do. <laughs> Whenever I got a promotion at Progressive, I would be full of joy and I would reward myself with a new car. Not like, you know, a new pair of pants or going out to dinner. <laughs> I'm talking about a new, yeah, a new car. I'm talking about a 2017 Forerunner or a Ram, you know, like big purchases. Those are nice rewards. They were awesome rewards. And you know yeah. what happened afterwards? It goes away. Buyer's remorse. Right. Yeah. I would get buyer's remorse. And I'm like, wow. I'm like, why are you spending all this money? And that was again. And it was almost... Now that I look back on it and I've reflected it, it's almost because it forced me to stay in my comfort zone. Because if I had all these bills to pay, well, how could I walk away from my job? I can't. Because if I do, I'm in a world of hurt. And in order to for me to take this now and, and leave it for forever... I got rid of all that stuff. Like I sold, we got rid of a car, you know, we, we got down to one car payment. We, instead of living in our house, we came down to Texas to live with my mother-in-law and rent out our other houses. So you became way more intentional with what you were doing. 100%. I leveraged my emotional intelligence to become more intentional and to set myself up for success rather than to allow my, my, financial situation to control me, I took control of it in order to live the life that I want to live. I think also like you you weren't happy with your W2 job. And when you go and you buy that car, you get that little, that little that bit hit. of time where you that are hit. a temporary that high. high. Yeah. Right. That high, man, but that goes away. So then you got to find a new temporary high and then you got to find a new temporary high. And then ultimately a lot of times that leads to a lot of bad decisions. It also can lead to addiction, right? Uh, yeah. Because if you're think about this, and it was the true, it was the case for me, right? I was empty inside. I was, I was empty. I had no, there were times in my life where I had no emotion whatsoever. So I would look to certain things to get me that temporary high, right? Women might be drinking, you know, and it was, it was a combination of all of those things. And typically one of those things would lead to the other, right? Like if I'm drunk, my inhibitions are lowered, right? So I can go do something else and not feel as guilty about it. Well, I'm drunk, you know, but you get that little high, what would happen? And this is when I really realized that like some of these, these were like legitimate addictions. Like I would have an out of body experience where I'm watching myself fuck up. I'm telling myself, why are you doing this? You know that this is bad for you. And I would do it anyway. Because I craved that dopamine hit or serotonin or whatever, you know, what is that? A hormone? Are those hormones? I don't know. I'm not a doctor, man. I'm not a doctor. (laughs) Oh, yeah. they. (laughs) Yeah. You're right. But whatever. I would get that high from those things and it would fill that void temporarily, but it was the same thing as buying a car. Guess what? As soon as it was done, it was done and I would crash and I would go even deeper and I would just continue to dig this fucking hole like we, you talked about and you mentioned and you asked me about for 17 years, 17 years, I would just dig deeper and deeper and deeper. So it was interesting. I started researching and doing some stuff. And guess what? The lack of emotional intelligence is a key indicator on whether somebody will become an addict, whether it's drugs, alcohol, gambling, video games, whatever it may be. If you lack emotional intelligence, that could potentially be a very realistic result for you is to get caught up in some form of addiction. Yeah. I, I think also the, like what goes on with that as well. Like I was in a similar position as you like looking for these temporary highs and, and just ultimately making one bad decision after another, which like that just puts you deeper and deeper into the hole, like you were saying, but then like you get this like imposter syndrome that we've discussed before. Like, I don't feel like if something good happened for me or like if something potentially like if we had an idea that was going to maybe take us somewhere, 
I would like self sabotage myself because I didn't mm-hmm. think that I deserved it. So then that you have that added on to all this other stuff that's taking place. And it just, it like, if you don't have a manage on your emotions, like you can spiral downward, downward pretty quickly and you could pretty stay quick. down there for a long time. Yeah. And think about that one decision, one decision can ruin your, and I don't, I don't want to say, well, it could, I mean, it, it could. freaking could, right. You getting drunk, getting into a car, killing somebody, killing yourself, paralyzing somebody, paralyzing yourself. Like not only are you ruining your life, you're ruining other people's lives. And there are so many people that are in fact are impacted by something along those lines. So like you said, they're learning to manage your emotions and not ignore them. Right. So I think that's a common mis- misconception is and we, we have talked about this a little bit too. It's like, well, don't get mad. No, I, I, I'm human being like, I'm going to get mad. It's a matter of, okay, I'm mad. Let me not act out of anger. Let me process my emotion here, figure out why I'm mad, address the root cause and not react to it. And the more that you practice it and and a big thing of practice is when you make a mistake, reflect on it and think about it, try to figure out why you did it and then get better moving. Own Own it it. too. Yeah. Yeah. Own it and then make improvement on it. 100%. And that when, that's when it comes down to ownership and actually taking action, right? Like you have to take action in order to make it better. But like, yeah. I don't know what it is with like, with like when, when we were growing up, it was like boys didn't show emotion. Like you were told yeah, to, to hide it or boys don't cry or you, you dig, you had just bury it. You just bury mm-hmm. it. So that, I mean, that's what I did. I like, I would just bury it. Well, mm-hmm. what happens when you bury emotions? You're going to ex- explode at some point. Like you can't, a person can only take so much. And if you're not dealing with it, it's going to come out and it's going to come out in a negative way. So like I would have these outbursts and everyone's mm-hmm. like, oh man, you have anger management issues. And I was like, yeah. I have anger management issues. So like, then I go to therapy and I'm talking to the therapist and like therapy for me, like I didn't, I didn't get a whole lot out of it. Cause I didn't want to talk about like four-year-old Randy like I didn't Mm -hmm. see how that was going to be beneficial but she did say something that made sense to me like anger is never the first emotion like it's not it's you're frustrated you're irritated maybe you're I don't know you're over excited like it's never just anger like what what made you angry something happened prior to that that triggered the anger response Mm -hmm. that made sense to me so like I try to focus on that now I still slip up like it's hard. It's not easy, like simple, but not easy. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, like it's, you're not going to be perfect with this stuff. And we say this a lot, like this is, it's not about being perfect. It's mm-hmm. a process. And it's the, the goal is to make progress along the way. You're going to slip up, but if you reflect on it and own it and then determine how am I going to make sure this doesn't happen again, that's being emotionally intelligent. Yeah. One thing too, that I forgot to share about that W2 journey, what I just realized when I was reading that book and I completely forgot to get back to it, but it was talking about identity and labels. One thing, and again, this comes back to emotional intelligence is I made my salary at Progressive part of my identity. So when I left Progressive, I lost part of my identity in my salary. I went from being somebody who made six figures to somebody who made whatever I made at that point. You know what I mean? Some weeks, not I might, six figures. Yeah. Might, some <laughs> weeks I might make five grand. Some weeks I made nothing. So it was just, again, I, I, I didn't have that realization until I read this book. I'm like, I made that part of my identity. And when I lost that again, that was that discomfort that I was feeling. So I ran back to the middle. I ran back to the middle of the page Instead of living in the margins on my own terms, I went back to what I knew and what I felt comfortable with. So let me ask you something. So how do you think emotional intelligence plays into leadership and when you're in a leadership role? I mean, you like you have to think about what you're you're dealing with another person. Right. So like another person's going to have emotions. Like if I'm coming to Kyle to talk to him about something, I need to take his emotions into account. Mm-hmm. And some people, some leaders are good at this. And then there's others who I, I don't call them leaders. I call them bosses or mm-hmm. managers. They're not leaders. They they're just this is what it is. They don't really care 
about about your feelings or you as a person. They just let's say Kyle shows up late to work one day. Do I call Kyle in and be like, what the hell, Kyle? You're five minutes late. This is unacceptable. Blah, blah, blah. Little do I know what maybe something catastrophic happened. And that's why Kyle's late. And now I've just made Kyle's day a hundred times worse. Just be a, be a decent human being. Think about other people's emotions. Yeah. Call him in, have a simple conversation with him. Kyle, what's going on? Mm -hmm. How you doing? How you doing? And maybe that'll come out in that conversation. So I feel like with a leader, you need to take, you need to make sure you're taking like a, 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 I'm using, I'm missing the word acknowledging Hmm. that other people have emotions and you need to think about that when you're talking with them. Yeah. And another thing that I look at it from that is why it's so important to get to know your people beyond just the day-to-day stuff that happens at work, because the better you know them, the easier it's going to be to recognize when something is going on with them from an emotional perspective. Right. And it can be they can be overly joyful and that's a great opportunity to build a connection and be loyal. Hey, like what's going on? Like I noticed you're just like, you're super happy right now. Like what, what's going on? Oh, my son just graduated college and I'm just, I'm so excited for him. I'm so proud of him. Right. And that's a way to build a connection and continue that conversation on after that day, you come back to it. It's like, Hey, you know, so this is a month later. Hey, I remember your son graduating college a couple or a month ago. What are they doing now? Like, how's everything going? Right. Those small things and building those connections and build, they go a long ways in building loyalty. Right. Because a, a leader in that case, that is something that some people that a boss or a manager with, you know, wouldn't necessarily do. So it's a great opportunity to build that emotional connection in other people to build that loyalty and to continue to build the strength within your team. So I totally agree with you that being able to recognize other people's emotions and take that into consideration with your approach to whatever that situation may be. That's a big one too. And then doing it yourself too. Like when it came back to, we talked about on the, on the connect call temper, right? There were so many times where I lost my temper when I was a leader, especially in the army, because (laughs) at that time I thought it was I thought it was like a good thing. Like, oh, this dude's like this guy yells and screams and he's he's a fucking, you know, badass because he does that shit. And it's like, yeah, I got to set the standard, you know, total or hold the line and do all this. And what I was doing was I was allowing somebody else to control my emotions because I lacked discipline. Like you had talked about on that call, a good leader doesn't lose their temper. right? Right. And yes. Does it happen from time to time? Yes. However, I shouldn't have lost my temper in front of all of my subordinates because that makes me look like somebody who is out of control. And that's I, definitely not something you want a leader. You just said that it happens from time to time. And and it does. And But should it? No, it should not. No, because if you are case. truly being emotionally intelligent, you're processing your emotions before you respond. So mm-hmm. as a leader, especially as a leader, you should not be losing your shit. Mm -hmm. That is you lacking discipline. That's what it is. You're lacking discipline. And if it does happen, then you need to take accountability and you need to make it right. Mm -hmm. You can't blame the person for you losing your shit. No, 100%. And it didn't happen nearly as severely at progressive as it did in the army. Like I learned from those, you know, those mistakes that I made and were there opportunities where I could have handled situations better Absolutely. But I wasn't screaming on the floor at people or anything like that. So I improved my level of discipline in those situations by learning from my mistakes in the army and applying them to progressive. Right. Right. So it's it it's about making mistakes and learning from them. Like, that's 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 life. Right. I'm not going to defend us in this. I'm just going to say when you and I were leaders in the military, we were ignorant and we didn't know (laughs) what we were doing. Like there was no like formal training, leadership training in the military. It was just like, Oh, you're an E five. Now you are responsible for these people. Here you go. Like no one showed us how to be leaders. We just thought like you're at basic drill sergeants yell to get their point across. We need to yell. Well, Mm -hmm. are people going to work hard for you if you're constantly screaming at them and making them feel like shit? No, no, no. They're going to do the bare minimum. They're going to do the bare minimum. They're going to do what they have to do 
so that you get off their back and they get their paycheck. So they're not going to go above and beyond for you. Like no. when me and you started like actually going outside while the rest of the upper leadership was hanging out in the room and we would go out there and actually like get our hands dirty and work with them. Like that earned their respect. Mm -hmm. And they would. So then like, we didn't have to yell. We could just ask them and they would go do it. And it was a lot easier, but that, I mean, that took us years to figure out. No. Uh, yeah. And it took a lot of emotional intelligence, right? Like, and discipline, because it would have been easy to go hang out with the other senior leaders and right. smoke and joke. Out. Yeah. And hang out in the AC. But, and, you know, I didn't want to go outside when it was hot or when it was rainy, right. you know, like, and don't get me wrong. Like there were times where we, we didn't do those things. One, because we couldn't, like, if we had something that we had to get done, like totally understand that. But when we had the opportunity, we tried to do those things because it built that loyalty and that connection. But again, the emotions that go into that, like, I think emotional intelligence and discipline are very tied together because I mean, they're all tied together. All these skills are tied together. 100%. But I think those two specifically, because you, you absolutely have to have discipline in order to be emotionally intelligent, because it's easy to fly off the handle. It's easy to get so excited that you make a decision in that moment that you may not want to be like, I think emotional intelligence and decision-making are huge together again. And not only with like the car purchasing, but when I make plans, like I'm in the moment, right? I'm hanging out with my buddies. Like we're, we're enjoying some beers. I'm in the moment. Hey, we should do this next weekend. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds great. <laughs> well, I'm not thinking, well, fuck next weekend. I'm probably not going to want to do that because I, I'm not going to be in the moment. Like, oh, right. You know, and naturally I'm a homebody, but so it's important to just think, take those things into consideration when, when you're making decisions as well. So we've talked a lot. We've talked about opportunities that we've had. We've talked talked about, reflecting on mistakes made but what are some what are some intentional things that you've done in order to improve your emotional intelligence like look this is still a daily struggle for me it's it's same this is this is going to be like a daily struggle for everybody because you have stressors in your life and these stressors add up and yeah like eventually like one after another you're you're gonna have the possibility of losing your shit and not everybody loses their shit some people some people cry and they get sad some people some people internalize it yeah they internalize some people just want to be alone they want to be left alone some people will watch a sad movie and eat a bunch of junk food so like you have to recognize that these things are happening and you have to hold yourself accountable when these things do happen and for me like I work with kids on a daily basis and, and kids will do things to try to get underneath your skin so they can get a reaction out of you. <laughs> kids do that. No yeah. way. It's crazy. And I know, right? And for me, like it's always been like, ugh, like <laughs> with, with how society is right now. And like, there's not a whole lot of accountability. So I'm always like pushing this accountability thing. And this accountability thing. Like I, I got to hold them accountable. I also have to not get into these to these battles with kids like there shouldn't it shouldn't be a power struggle like I don't need to sit there and argue with a seven year old like that mm -hmm. like even with my own kids I don't need to do that I just need to make my point and then walk away and then like that's where you take take a few minutes you get your bearings straight you do your breathing exercises if you have to and then you can come back and you can talk to them again so like hey I gave you a couple of options. What did you decide to do? And then you go from there. But if I sit there and I just argue back and forth with, with a child, what am I gaining out of that? Mm -hmm. I'm going to end up getting mad. They're going to get mad. And then like, nobody's going to win in this instance. And then we're both going to have a shitty rest of the day. So I'm learning that I need, I need to, you know, I need to take breaks. I need to walk away. I need to get my, my mind straight before I go back and have another conversation. And when you do that, like that conversation is a lot easier when you're, when you're not having a temper. Yeah. Do you ever, one thing that I do is I have internal conversations with myself. Like I'm literally talking to my ego. I'm talking to myself, trying to figure out why I'm angry. Like, do you have internal conversations with yourself when it comes to the emotions that you're feeling in that, in a specific situation? 
sometimes it depends on the situation. Like I, I need to get better at it. This is where I struggle the most is, is the emotional intelligence. Like I, I have always buried my emotions. Mm -hmm. I don't like talking about them. I don't like even admitting that I have them. Like I used to joke around with people and I'd be like, I, well, I, I don't have to worry about it because I don't have a heart. <laughs> and I'm using saying that. Yeah. Like I'm using humor in that instance, but like emotions make me uncomfortable. I, this is, this is the thing that makes me most uncomfortable. I hate expressing them. I don't like talking about them and I have to be intentional with, with my girls with emotions, because if I don't, then I'll just ignore things or I won't say things to them that I should be saying to them. Like when mm -hmm. I, the, when I, the way I was raised, like there wasn't a whole lot of, emotional stuff that took place in our house and like no fault of my parents that's just that's just how it was so like like simply just hugging someone and saying i love you like i'm not used to that and i mm -hmm. like your kids need that so i have to make sure i have to be intentional i have to force myself to do it which sound like i don't want it to sound bad like i'm forcing myself to tell my kids <laughs> i love them because i do love my children it's just it's i'm uncomfortable expressing that but yeah. I have to make sure that I do it because I don't want to screw them up by not saying those things to them. So yes, yeah. I do have those internal conversations with myself, but what I have to remember is like when I am getting angry, like I need to make sure that I'm having those internal conversations. Cause sometimes I'll just, I'll just flip. Like, yeah. I don't even think I just see red and then I react. And that is not, that's usually when you say something stupid or you do something stupid and then you get yourself into trouble. Yeah. And, but I, I, I resonate with you saying like, you have to force yourself to do it. And again, it's not that you don't, but sometimes you have to force yourself over that discomfort in order to embrace your emotions and improve that emotional intelligence. Because again, it comes down to that. Like my friends, like I didn't say I love you to my friends a lot, especially my male friends. Right. Like, but now I try to make much more of an effort of telling them, Hey, I love you. I love you like a brother, like a friend. You know what I mean? Like there's nothing wrong with doing that stuff. But again, at first it was a little uncomfortable, right? Yeah. It's a little yeah, weird. Like, even having these conversations, like when you and I first started talking about this stuff, it was super uncomfortable for me. Right. But like, I, I don't know where it came from. Like, I don't know. I don't know if it's like how society was when we were growing up or if it was how I was raised or if it was just the activities I was involved in, but it was like, you had toxic to have that, masculinity. Yeah. Really. You had to have that tough, <laughs> that tough guy persona. And if you showed anything other than like the tough guy persona, you were weak. Then, then you were weak. Mm -hmm. So that is what is ingrained in me. And it's so hard for me to show the other side. It's so hard for me. And I'm always like, no, like, if, if like my daughter falls off her bike or something and she's crying, like my wife will run up and like hug her and be like, Oh, you're okay. And I'm like, you're fine. Suck it up. Get back on the bike. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just like, yes, there are times for that, but it yes. can't be that all the time. And that is yeah. how, that's how I am. I'm like that all the time. Like I need, I have to force myself and I think I've gotten better, but I still have to force myself. Even like with my wrestlers, like, mm -hmm. It, it like and this hurts this hurts the ego when when you they say this kind of stuff to you but i had one of my better wrestlers was like i told him he ended up placing at state his senior year and he was and i was like that was awesome good job and he's like th he's like that was only like the fourth time you've ever said good job to me in yeah. seven years and i was like like when i really reflected on that i was like damn like really i never mm -hmm. i never said good job more than that it was always like okay he came off the mat he won I would tell him what he did well. I'd be like, hey, that was like, you did this well. And then I would be like, all right, but this is what we need to fix so mm -hmm. that we can get ready for the next one. Like, I never was like, hey, man, that was awesome. Like, that yeah. was it. That was awesome. It was always, all right, you did this okay, but this is this is what we need to fix so that we can get to the next level. Yeah, and you got to be intentional with celebrating the, the success, right? Celebrate the process, celebrate the success. But I think that's, again, that comes to emotional intelligence is – we and this is i think the male energy so there's a female energy and there's a male energy and we all exist in both right but some of us are more one than the other and you could be a male that has a higher female energy and a, a female that has a higher male energy but typically when you're a high male energy it's constantly the next thing this happens right. and you're on to the next thing well you have to 
control those emotions and moving straight on to the next thing and embrace the moment and celebrate what's going on right now. And that's a lot of what it takes to be present. You, in order to be present, you have to control those emotions of already moving on to the next thing and focusing strictly on the results, right? We talk about that too, you know, the enjoying the process and enjoying the journey and embracing that. That's huge. And it takes an emotional intelligence to be present and to focus, right? This is a huge thing when it comes to being present. The Browns? And no, <laughs> my cell phone. And I'm like, oh, yeah, what, what is on my phone right now that I'm waving around? Yeah. It's going to be on YouTube and everything. It was just a text. Well, but the Browns, the Browns also. The make- Browns <laughs> test my emotional intelligence. I shattered my favorite, the goddamn Jets, that Jets game this year. I took my favorite Browns cup when they I'm like, there is no way that we're going <laughs> to blow this. And I shattered my glass all over that. And guess what? What did that do? It did nothing. I ruined my glass. Callie was mad glass. at me. I had, had to ba- clean I, it up. I had to clean it up. I had a bad rest <laughs> of my day. It was, yeah, the Browns definitely test my emotional talent. But honestly, like I've, I, after that day, I've gotten, I definitely got better at that because I reflected on it. I'm like, why are you, why are you allowing something that you have zero control over (laughs) that has no impact really on your life? Right. Right. Like whether they win or lose, my life stays the same. And will I be happy when I, I am happy when they win because they're my team and I root for them, but Man, they, like that's so unemotionally intelligent too. And you look like such a child when you lose your temper over a a freaking game, like a game, a game that you're you're not I'm even not, playing. In. I'm not <laughs> even in it. Like it's so dumb. It's so dumb. But I, that was a wake up call for me that day. Where I'm like, I gotta let doing this because I was letting those days when the Browns lose, which is all the often, time, very often, very often. <laughs> my Monday would be shot. Like, I would just stew in this and it, I had no control over it. So that's another big thing with emotional intelligence is why are you wasting energy and time on things that are with that are outside of your control? It doesn't make sense. Focus on the things that you can control. Take ownership of those things and impact them. And what you can control and manage again, I should say I'm very cautious about the word control, but you can manage your emotions and you can prevent them from from a bad moment turning into a bad day. One thing that I've done lately to be very intentional with my emotional intelligence growth has been daily gratitude. So I talked about this a little bit, but I read the miracle morning and I adopted that practice by taking a few minutes every day to think about all of the things that I'm grateful for in that moment. That has helped me keep things in perspective and manage my emotions better. When I start thinking about something in a negative mindset, I remind myself of all of the other things that I have in my life that I'm grateful for. And then that whatever it is that's going on in that moment, it doesn't seem so bad. Right. That kind of puts things in like perspective. 100%. And if you adopt that and you mean it, like you have to mean it. And there are some days where it's easier than others to truly mean it because it's like, oh, I'm thanking myself for my health again. Of course I am because I'm in (laughs) freaking, I have, I am blessed to have great health. You know, I know plenty of people and, and we do, you know, we had a great friend that unfortunately isn't with us any longer that and i i should say so he and i weren't super close you grew up with him you knew him much better than i did but he was a friend of mine i was at his house right before he unfortunately passed away you know helping with some work around there but to be as to be grateful for your health that's like i mean that's just a freaking blessing and some days I take that for granted. And it also reminds me, like, stop taking this shit for granted. Like, I thank myself, you know, or I, excuse me, I express gratitude for that. I express gratitude for my family, for my wife, and for what we're doing right now every single day. And I mean it. And it's, again, some days it's easy, some days it's hard, but I mean it because, man, what a blessing that we have that we are where we are right now that we have the the things that we have and that we have the physical health that we have as well and it's something that we work on every single day is this something that you're like writing down and journaling or are you just kind of sitting there reflecting on it 
So I do both. So every morning what I do is, so I'll give you my morning routine. So I get up, my alarm goes off at five or four 45. I typically stay in bed with my wife and, but specifically my dog. So Sophie sleeps with me. I I'll pet her. I'll cuddle her for 15 minutes. I get out of bed at five, brush my teeth, do all that, go out into the living room, meditate for five minutes. And the way that I meditate is I practice my gratitude while I meditate. So I close my eyes. I'm in a dark room, but I'm not in bed. I don't do it in bed. I go out into the living room and I just for five to 10 minutes, however long it is, I'll just sit there and I'll think about those things. And then when I'm done thinking about my, my, what I'm grateful for, I just try to clear my mind completely. And that's hard (laughs) trying to clear your mind where you're not getting these constant incoming thoughts. So I do that and then I journal and sometimes I'll include in my journaling some gratitude, right? But a lot of what I journal about is just reflecting on the day before. Then I read my 20 pages and then I send all of my accountability text messages in the morning. And at that point I start making coffee. I take the dogs out, but, and, and here's the great part by doing all of those things in the morning, which are very important to me and important to my, oh, and I read my affirmations too. So I have on my phone, I have all my daily affirmations, which I highly recommend to everybody. It also helps you with that belief, you know, controlling your fear, but some of my daily affirmations. Give us a couple examples of those. Yeah. So you are a thoughtful, caring, loving husband to Callie and continue to focus on growing to be even better. She is the most important person in your life. Never forget that. Your parents have retired and live on your property in their own space. Being able to thank them for all they have or all they have done for you is a blessing. So this is one I'm projecting into the future, right? Your success will not exceed your personal development. Your relentless focus on growth will provide you with your wildest dreams. They say misery loves company, but so does mediocrity. Don't let the limiting beliefs of others limit what's possible for you. Add value to each and every person and situation you encounter. You only fail when you quit. Always forward. Everything you always wanted is within your reach. Always believe. I am committed to maintaining unwavering unwavering faith that I will reach my goal and put forth extraordinary effort until I do no matter what. There is no other option. Perfection is achieved not when there is nothing more to add, but when there is nothing more to take away. Spend money on memories, experiences, investments, and yourself. You will always make it back. And then the last one I just added, you will make $5,000 a month in passive income by 2024. So that's awesome. Yeah. The way that I look at these, these are reminders. These are things that the more that I read them and the more that I believe them, the easier they are to become true or to continue to be true. Yeah. It's like, it's like a visualization. Like athletes use that all the time. Like they see it before they, they do it. My vision board. Exactly. Like a couple, <laughs> like three years ago, if you would have talked to me about this, I'd have been like, that shit's corny. That's corny. Dude, a year ago, I would have said that. Yeah. Like, I, I'm not doing that. That's corny as shit. But like, when you look at like successful people, like visual visualization is huge. Like, I, I remember yeah. being like my college coaches are like, you should sit down and you should, you should have the match in your mind, like play it out move by move before you even go out there, visualize what you want to mm-hmm. do. And the mm-hmm. ones who did that were successful. And the ones who didn't weren't as successful. I mean, yeah. And and there's a dichotomy there because you know what happened with me in baseball? I would tell myself, I'm not going to strike out. I'm not going to strike out. I'm not going to strike out. So what I was visualizing was striking out because I kept saying that I'm not going to strike out. So I was visualizing striking out. If I would have gone up there and be like, hey, you're going to get a hit. You're going to make contact. You're going to make contact. You're going to make contact. I I would have still struck out sometimes, but right. But you're looking at it. You were looking at the negative instead of the positive. Yeah, exactly. And I didn't realize that, man, there was so much emotion that went into that. There was so much fear of striking out instead of visualizing the amazing feeling that I got whenever I got a hit in baseball. It was it was a high like it was this it was this awesome feeling that I had just done something incredible. I should have been leveraging that emotion to visualize but instead i was visualizing based off fear like we didn't plan on going into talking about athletics with this or performance but if you can't manage your emotions 
they will ruin your performance. They will ruin it. Absolutely. Like you ever have a good day of jits when you're in a horrible mindset going in? I mean, there's been a couple times. Usually I have a better performance when I'm when I'm in a better mindset. Right. Or think about it this way. How do you handle getting your ass kicked when you're in a negative mindset compared to when you're in a very positive <laughs> mindset? Not as not as well. <laughs> <laughs> right. When I'm going and I'm in a positive mindset, or I'm in a good headspace. My emotions are in check. I I don't care. I'm living in the moment. I'm having fun. I'm learning from what's happening. When I go into it and I'm pissy and pissed off, which doesn't happen frequently anymore. So this is going back in time. Well, I haven't trained in almost two months now because I've been in Texas and I'm I'm intentionally taking a break from jujitsu too because my body was just hurt but i would i would that's when i threw temper tantrums and i would get choked out or you know get submitted and i would throw a freaking hissy fit and it was stupid and i was going into that with a bad mindset and i wasn't managing those emotions and trying to leave that at the door when i walked into the gym and stepped onto the mat yeah for me like it would lead to like quiet ride homes like i would play mm -hmm. no music and i would just sit there like what what the hell just happened? Why am I doing this? <laughs> There's a gift that I've seen about that. <laughs> right. When, you're, when you <laughs> get your ass kicked all day at jujitsu, so you just drive home with the radio off, thinking about like how much you suck. Like, it, <laughs> like, like you don't really think about. Like, I never thought about this like growing up, but like my, I would let my emotions affect me so much that when I would go out there, like I, my energy was drained. Nope. Like I had nothing left because the whole time I was thinking like, you've worked so hard. If you go out there and you fail right now, you're letting everybody down. You're letting yourself down. All mm -hmm. that work you did will just be down the drain. And then I would go out there, energy gone. I had nothing mm -hmm. in the tank. And then it would be like, it would be a terrible performance. I would wrestle to not lose. I would not open up and, and try to hit moves. I would, the match would be super close. And then I would either, most of the time I would, I would lose in that instance because I was just trying not, not to lose and mm -hmm. which resulted in, in me losing. And it just, it's crazy. Like when you, when you listen to like the good, the, the elite athletes, they're like, it's just a game. It's just, right. Game. Right. If I, if I lose this, what, what, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. Like my parents are going to stop loving me. I'm a terrible person. No, it's a game. If you lose, then you look at what you did wrong. You fix it. And you try to improve the next time. That, I mean, that's all it is. Right. And in the most talented people in the world that aren't able to overcome their emotions and their mindset, like a negative mindset, they typically don't make it very, very far. Right. Like there are plenty of people that have had their careers cut short because they lack emotional intelligence. Right. I'm sure we can think of. Antonio Brown <laughs> it's a good example and I think there's more going on there I think that might be like CTE but, but there's a lot yeah and I think it's a big thing with fighters specifically too like a lot of fighters you guys are head cases right and they might be the most talented person in the world but if they can't overcome a negative mindset like you have to be in a growth mindset in order to continue to get better if you just rely on talent I was in football huge I didn't push myself. I allowed my ego to take control. I was a gamer, you know, like, oh, I don't have to practice hard. I just turn it on. I just turn it on for the turn game. Turn it on in the game. Right. And I could do that as a freshman because right. I was six three. And most cornerbacks, when you're a freshman in high school, are short. Well, I stopped putting in the effort and I got to the, the more senior levels. And well, guess what? People at Division One high school football in the state of Ohio are pretty good, <laughs> you know? And then right. I went to college and it was even bigger wake up call. It's like, dude, you can't, you're, you're getting your fucking ass kicked out here. So, yeah. So we went into a lot today about emotional intelligence. You and I have been talking about it for over two hours at this we point. Have. Yeah. So what is one piece of advice that you want to leave everybody with today? So, I, I mentioned this on the connect call as well. Um, I mean, you're, you're going to experience emotions. There's no way around that. You can't avoid those things. And like a lot of times, yeah, like throughout the day, your emotions are going to build up. And for me, like everybody is going to be able to, to deal with this differently. Like you have to find a way to deal with your emotions, 
find something that you enjoy doing that you can do on a daily basis. That's going to allow you to deal with those. And for me, like when I get off work, the first thing I do is I do, I work out, I have to do a workout and it allows me to release all that frustration or whatever emotion it was throughout the day. And then I can, I can calm down and I can be with my family. If I, if I come home and I don't work out and get that, that aggression out or whatever it is, then I'll tend to be a little more pissier and I'll probably be short tempered and I may take it out on my kids, which is not fair to them. So you have to find a way to deal with this stuff. And exercise is a great outlet. Some people like to do artwork. Some people like to listen to music, go on a walk. I mean, you find whatever you like to do and do that on a daily basis and it'll help you manage these emotions. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think that's great advice. And that's, that's what I leverage physical stuff for as well. I mean, there's many things, but one of the keys is, is emotions and being able to get that out, right? Like if I'm pissed off and I go to jujitsu now that I've learned to become more emotionally intelligent and I go hard when it comes to sparring time and I just leave it all out there, feel freaking incredible even if i get my ass kicked i feel free of all of that weight from the day so i think that's great advice so the advice that i want to leave everybody with is when you're like let's use a workout as an example most of us we get up in the morning and we have this battle with ourselves and it's like do i really want to go to the gym right now do i want to drive up there do i want to put in that much effort think about how you feel after you get done working out and now think about how you feel from an emotional standpoint when you skip that workout right i never go to the gym and regret going to the gym never once have i ever gone and done a workout and be like oh man i really shouldn't have done that (laughs) however when i skip a workout which typically doesn't happen. What typically happens is I'm like, "Ah, I'm not going this morning. And then I feel so guilty and so bad that I didn't get my workout in. And I have all of this frustration built up because I didn't get it out in the morning. Why would I prevent myself from doing that? Right? So I have this internal conversation with myself over constantly. I might do it until the minute I get out of the car to step into the gym. I'm telling myself, I could just turn around and go back to bed. No, I'm thinking about the reward that I'm going to get from doing it, getting it done and getting it in. So there are so many things involved when it comes to emotional intelligence. But again, that that right there is an example of discipline. That's I an awesome example. Though. Yeah, like, it's, a, it's a great example. Thank you. I, I thought it was great. Well, I mean, there's like there's a book that I read. <laughs> uh, it's called Chosen Suffering. And it's by um, his name is Tom Ryan. He's the Ohio State uh, head men's wrestling coach. Mm hmm. And like you, you choose your suffering there. What do you want your suffering to be? Do you want the the chosen suffering to be the workout? Or do you want the suffering to be that guilt that you're going to have from skipping the workout? Like Mm. which one's going to be more beneficial to you? There's some things that you can choose and there's some things that you can't choose. It's what's within your control. Even, even Dave Goggins says that he's, he'll stare at his shoes yeah. for 30 minutes before he's going out to run. He's like, I don't want to, I don't want to go on. this. Well, run. if I was going for a 200 mile run, I would probably <laughs> do the same thing and be like, wow, what am I doing? If you haven't read chosen suffering, you need to read chosen suffering. I have not read chosen suffering. So I just wrapped up the Eagle that drank hummingbird nectar and thank you to my uncle Bill. I am now reading the book of Job, which is spelled job, but it is actually way outside of my comfort zone. It is a religious writing, and that is not something that I typically partake in, but he said that it was very impactful for him, and I appreciate that and him sharing that. So I started that this morning, and I'm looking forward to getting getting into it more. Well, when you come home, we're going to swap books, and you're going to give me whatever the hell you're saying. I don't remember the title. Eagle hummingbird. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I'm going to give you chosen suffering, which does have like a religious, like it's built on religion, but it's also like, there's other things that, that play into it that I think will be impactful. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I will leave everyone with this quote today. So I can't remember who said it, but the quote is pain is inevitable. Suffering is a choice. So think about that from an emotional standpoint. And thank you again, everybody, for listening. 
the connect call again was this month we are may 16th that was tonight we talked about emotional intelligence next month we have to figure out the date and the time but it will be well no i'm sorry it's the third tuesday of the month so it'll be the third tuesday of june whatever that date is at 7 p.m i have to think about that actually let's talk hold on hold on hold on i might be home for for the next one Oh, man. We might be able to do the next connect call in person, Randy. That would be insane. So one, two, we will. I'm flying home June 19th. So we'll be able to do the 20th, the 20th. And that's going to be on your favorite. So that is accountability. That is that is the next letter, I believe. That is the next letter. So we're going to talk about accountability and Look out for the invitation for that. We'll keep the price the same this month. It's 10 bucks. It's an hour. It's a group coach setting. Highly recommend joining. If you talk to anybody that's been on those calls, definitely beneficial. And we're continuing to make it better every single month. So thanks again for everybody for coming out and to listening. It means a lot to us. Appreciate it. And if you are looking for a more personalized approach, we do have the ideal coaching which you we can do. We do have ideal coaching. So reach out to us. You can reach us at the best email address right now is going to be ideal.meetup.inbox at gmail.com, which is going to change soon. Once we have the website, we'll make some better, <laughs> we'll make some better email addresses, but that'll be the best one. Or reach out to us on social media, Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, however you find us, we're out there. Just reach out in general. If you, even if you don't want to do any of those things, just you know, yeah. communicate with us. Let us know what we're doing right, what you don't like. Just some conversation. Absolutely, sounds good. All right, have a good night, everybody. Stay classy. You didn't do bye. bye. <laughs> <laughs> hey, everybody! If you liked what you heard today, please check us out on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter. And don't forget to head to Eventbrite and grab one of the ten tickets available for our monthly Ideal Connect call. Then when you're ready to take the next step, message us on any of our social media pages to book a free coaching consultation call to see how we can help you start living your own ideal life. Thanks again for all of your love and support. And always remember, you have everything you need to achieve success. It's just a matter of believing.